Good morning to you. This is another little village that's quite close to where I live. Um, I'll try and pan the camera up. You can see there the, uh, the Saxon Tower. They're usually round. That one's a little bit octagonal, which is quite unusual. Um, but uh, the reason I'm showing you this is I want to show you an interesting grave. Um, I know a lot of you are not really into gravestones or reading them, but um, one particular one here really strikes me and I'd like to share it with you. Uh, hopefully you can read this. Um, when I'm looking at the camera at the moment, it mirrors it, so it turns it the other way. I'm trusting that it will do that for me when you actually watch the video. But um, as you can see here, it says, in loving memory of Harry Bryden, called to rest 14th August 1986, age 75. He was the vicar of the church here. It says here the rector. And uh, there were three little churches that he was the rector of. Not for very long, for five years. And then it says down here also of, of his beloved wife, Hilda Bryden. And look at the age she got to, 102 years. And uh, living from 1910 to 2012. And what really strikes me is that sometimes I, I do a calculation on these graves. And uh, just to see who died first and how long one was widowed to the other. And uh, as you can see here, Hilda lived an awfully long time after her husband. 1996, 2006, there were 26, 27 years of widowhood. And uh, what crossed my mind was her dedication to her husband. She possibly could have married again and uh, met someone else and had a happy life, but she chose not to. And uh, she chose to be reunited with her husband in glory, trustfully. And um, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Loyalty. Being um, so in love with your spouse that you can uh, wait until you see them again in glory and stay loyal to them. And today, of course, we live in a world where there's not an awful lot of loyalty, and um, which is a real shame. And uh, I just thought I'd pull that up and uh, think about what real romance is all about. Loving one another to the end and uh, maybe even waiting to see one another in glory. So I thought I'd show you that and uh, I'll just pop inside and uh, I'll share the word with you. So good morning to you from All Saints Gislam. Uh, you might know that that's a familiar backdrop. I've used it before in many of my, my videos and uh, I just felt to come in here this morning and um, it's a quiet place. And uh, it's interesting when you contemplate the Word of God and uh, of course, at the moment, lots of us are con contemplating um, the prophetic scriptures as we're starting to see things come to pass. And we're, we've got our heads down, haven't we, into things like the book of Revelation. But um, it isn't only the book of Revelation that, that speaks of, of the last days, that speaks of uh, the prophecies that are spoken of in, in that book. And... Um, I want to take you this morning to, to the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, and just have a look at what it's saying here. We, we very often gloss over these minor prophets and don't recognize what they're, what they're actually saying to us and how they tie up with all the other scriptures. Now, it would be a long message if I did tie up the other scriptures with this, and I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to read Zechariah 14, and um, let's see how the Lord takes it. Behold... The day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. There, straight away, what is God saying? He's talking of a future time. I will gather all nations. This is talking about, of course, Armageddon. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. The Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations, as when he fought in the day of battle. We know that this is referring to a future time. Of course, there was a, a partial fulfillment, certainly in AD 70, um, as we know when uh, Jerusalem was ransacked and when the temple was destroyed 
And a lot of people will stop there and they'll say, well, that's already been fulfilled. But sometimes we, we see that Scripture is, is speaking to us on multi-levels. And uh, we have to take this all in that context. And as it says here, he will go forth, the Lord himself. This is a different battle, isn't it? This is something else. And he goes on here, verse 4. And this is the particularly key verse here. And his feet, this is physical, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, toward the east and toward the west. Can you imagine that, sign, that scene? The Lord descends, and suddenly the, the geophysical structure of that place just completely changes. And there shall be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. God's plans. God's plans are wrapped up in his judgments. This is going to be a time, such a time of tumult. He goes on here in verse 5. And you shall flee to the valley of the mountains. Reminds me again of Matthew 25. Fleeing into the hills, fleeing into the mountains. For the valley of the mountains shall reach into Azael. Yea, ye shall flee, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. There again, that future time. This is the Lord coming after the rapture, coming back to earth with the rest of us those that have died in Christ and the wonder of it all. Can you get the scene in your mind here? Very often we don't lift the words off the page. And I think it's so important to do that. And it goes on in verse 6. This is quite interesting here. See, this is God's strategic plan. He takes us up in the rapture. And we don't know time scales, of course. But we know that we're coming back down again. And this is the way that God is bringing us back down with him. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. Jerusalem is the key to all future prophetic fulfillment. And verse 6 is interesting here, verses 6 and 7. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. This is a complete turning around, isn't it, of, of what we understand to be night and day. And I, the Lord spoke to me in, about these two verses, and I had the sense that this is a transition period, that this is the Lord bringing in his, his glorious kingdom, but it's going to be a, a, a day of confusion as well, especially for those that are dwelling on the earth that took the mark of the beast that don't know him. It will be a confusing day. Evening will seem like light. You won't know if it's day or night. It will be a confusing day, a day that will be like none other day, but a transition day. And it goes on in verse 8. And it shall be in that day. Note. Note the particularness of, of God's word in that day, that specific day that was being referred to. The living waters, and this is, this is where all the, all the real change starts to come about. Living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea. In summer and in winter shall it be. This is another kind of water, isn't it? This is a pure water of God. Reminds me again of Revelation, doesn't it? The river of the water of life, clear as crystal. This, of course, is, is a, a, in a sense a foreshadowing of that eternal water. Because in, in that part of Revelation, I think it's talking about the new heaven and the new earth. In verse 9, it says here, And the Lord, this is the declaration of this chapter, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, shall there be one Lord and his name one. And of course, we know that to always be true, don't we? 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That was the very first thing I ever learned. Um, I think I can still recite it in Hebrew. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Yes, from Hebrew school, I remember it. The Lord is one, but he will be showing himself to be one at this time. He will be physically seen. This is the difference. He will reign. And he does it for that reason, to show that he will reign on the earth. No more governments. No. Men won't be messing it up again. Jesus will be bringing complete control. But it won't be a tyranny. It will be a joyous kingdom. Going on here. Verse 11. This is an interesting verse. And men shall dwell in it. And there shall be no more utter destruction. But Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. For the previous verse, I wasn't going to read simply because of all the, the different names, but um, the culmination of what's taking place here. Men shall dwell in it. I love the word shall because it, it, it speaks of that prophetic future. There will be no more utter destruction. Everything will be perfectly sound, perfectly held in God's hand. No more worries, no more tears. I've said these things before. I don't want to bang on at the same things, but it's a hope that we have to look forward to. And I don't know how many of you are waking up this morning with hopeless situations in your life. Things that you have to face day by day by day, be it physical illness, be it difficulties in your families. We all have them. We all have to face them. And we know that there will be future times still in these dark days and we'll face more and more. But there's a promise. This is the millennial promise of Zechariah 14. Verse 12, it says, but this is the different. Now, this is where it gets a little bit, um, where it changes. Because we begin to understand here that God brings his judgments into the earth. He's not just coming in glory with the saints. He has to come with a judgment in order to bring about this millennial kingdom. And uh, he says here in verse 12, and it shall be, this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people. See, there's a backwards and forwards motion here, isn't there? He's talking about the end result in verse 11. But he's also going back to tell you how that end result's going to be achieved and what's got to happen before it. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. You see, there has to be a judgment. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet. And their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. It's quite interesting as I was reading that. I don't know if any of you have ever seen the, the Jason Robards film, The Day After. Uh, it speaks of, an, of, of a nuclear attack, and you see this bomb drop from a distance, and you see this mushroom cloud rise up, and you actually see people standing, and the flesh just literally melts off them. Uh, there's a, a particular scene where it's, it lasts for a couple of seconds. You see this couple marrying, and uh, she's standing there in a wedding dress. And the next thing you see, two skeletons standing. And uh, I don't know that this is, if this is referring to a nuclear holocaust. I don't know. This looks to me more like God's particular judgment. And um, the thought that this, this is what will happen to those that are not following the Lord those that maybe that have taken the mark of the beast and have worshipped him. And verse 13, And it shall come to pass in that day, in that day, note, that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. Here we're talking about the wrath of God. And they, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. What does that speak about? The love of many will grow cold. All these foreshadowings are taking place now. We will, they will betray one another and hate one another. Jesus spoke of these things, didn't he? And for, verse 14, And Judah shall fight at Jerusalem, and the wealth of all the heathen round about shall be gathered together. There's another shout. All the wealth shall be gathered together, the gold and the silver. Remember what God says, the gold is mine and the silver is mine. Everything shall belong to the Lord in, this, in these days. 
and apparel in great abundance. And so shall be the plague of the horse, of the mule, of the camel, and of the ass, and of all the beasts that shall be in these tents. As this plague, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king. This is the millennial kingdom, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. You see, there'll be institutions of the old feasts again. That's what it's saying here. This particular one, maybe not all of them. We don't know. But certainly the Feast of Tabernacles, that one will be reinstituted. There will be requirements in the millennium. Because there will be survivors of, of the tribulation. There will be survivors of, of, of that time. And they will be required to go up to worship the Lord of hosts. No, they won't have the same bodies as the saints. But they will still be required by God. Because God's theocratic rule is going to be prevalent. I'll finish the chapter here. And it shall be that whoso will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king. You see, everybody still continues to have a free will. The Lord of hosts, even upon them, shall be no rain. And if the family of Egypt go not up and come not, they have no, that have no rain, there shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This millennial kingdom is really a transition time, isn't it, as well? There's going to be all sorts of things going on on the earth at that time. But I think that with the Lord Jesus reigning on earth, this is just my, my thought now, I don't say it's for definite, but I would think that with his physical reign on earth, those that um, are of the families it's talking about here, they won't want to not obey the Lord because they will know that he will, his word stands that it isn't just some distant promise for the future, because he will be physically reigning. And he goes on, verses 19. <clears throat> this shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is going to be a very important feast in the Millennial Kingdom. And in that day, there it is again, there shall be upon the bells of the horses, I love the capital letters here, Holiness unto the Lord. And the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Everything will be holy. Even the, the vessels that are used in the least that we would think about, even they are holy unto the Lord. Yea, every pot in Jerusalem and in Judah shall be holiness unto the Lord of hosts. And all they that sacrifice shall come and take of them and seethe therein. And in that day... There shall be no more the Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. No more will contaminate the house of the Lord of hosts. Jesus won't have to come in with a whip to turf out those that, that are dishonoring the Lord's house. And we will have the Lord's house. We will have new temples renewed. In the twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. Can you see how all these scriptures tie up? God wants to bring us together as it says there back in verse 11, that, um, let's just go back to that a second, where are we, verse 11, and men shall dwell in it, and there shall be no more utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited, safely inhabited under God's protection and love. And that's the end of the story, folks. We know the end from the beginning. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a great hope to hang on to? What a miserable man I would be if I didn't have the thought that, and the knowledge that there is a resurrection coming. That's the basis and the key of our faith, isn't it? It's what we're here for. So um, I leave that scripture with you today. And uh, remember God's strategic plan. And he's bringing it about bit by bit. Even though we're going to see many, many hurdles, many, many bumps along the way, God will have his way in our lives and in the time to come in his glorious reign. Have a blessed day.